Hi, I'm Rachel Callanan. I'm lead senior staff attorney at Public Health Law Center, and I lead our Minnesota program. So um, hopefully my face is familiar to some of you. Um, if not, we will, I'm sure, work together in the coming years. But um, welcome to our walk down memory lane today. This is going to be really interesting. And I have to say, I have the privilege of moderating this panel um, with these amazing commercial tobacco leaders that collectively represent 147 years, I did the math last night, um, of work specifically in commercial tobacco. Um, so we have a lot of history, a lot of great information to share, uh, for them to share. So, and thanks to them, the Minnesota and the entire nation really, because they broke a lot of new ground um, nationwide, not just for Minnesota, um, but we have all benefited from their dedication, um, their expertise and their devotion to fighting this fight for public health um, for all Minnesotans. Um, and as you'll hear, their work over the years did not come without some cost and sacrifice. So I do wanna mention that we're grateful to the families and friends of all four of you uh, who have really shored all of you up over these years to continue the fight um, to pursue this important work of public health. Uh, and as one of the reasons that we held this webinar is because we know there are many new public health advocates just entering the movement, or some of us have been around sort of an intermediate time frame. So we wanted to share with everyone, old and new, the incredible work that we all get to build from, thanks to these panelists today. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, all the other many, many advocates over the years who have blazed this trail for us. And as you know, history is always in the making. Um, most often, it is never written down. So we get to hear these stories today. Uh, and we get to, through this webinar, document some of our history uh, in this movement uh, to both give us a glimpse into the past, but also to help inform our current and future fights on this front. So electronic cigarettes, synthetic nicotine, um, constantly seeing new products and new players. And so we can learn a lot from the history uh, and hopefully some of the themes that they're gonna pull out today uh, will sound familiar because we know history repeats itself. And so a lot of these stories um, are, you know, we're gonna continue to make these fights. So with that, I wanna introduce each of our speakers. We'll start with Jeannie Weigum. She's the president of the Association for Non-Smokers Minnesota. She's been in this role as a volunteer executive director since 1980. The Association for Non-Smokers Rights, as it was called at the time, was fighting for the, the nation's first statewide clean indoor air law in 1975. Jeannie saw an ad in the local paper about the association's work and decided to become a member. And it only cost $1. So after becoming a member, Jeannie, Jeannie soon joined the answer board and eventually moved her way up to the full-time president. So from groundbreaking smoke-free housing work to innovative approaches to preventing youth tobacco use, she has provided strategic direction for numerous public policy wins in Minnesota. She remains deeply committed to enhancing public health and her community. Uh, her passion for this work is unparalleled uh, for those of you who have ever worked with Jeannie, um, it, but it may only be matched by her commitment to her work with rescue dogs, raising countless litters of puppies and finding forever homes for so many of our furry friends. So thank you for that, Jeannie. Um, next, I'll introduce Pat McCone. She's Senior Director, Director of Public Policy and Advocacy at the American Lung Association. Uh, she has worked with lung health pro programming for over 45 years. Um, Pat's work has included tobacco cessation programs for adults and youth, limiting youth access to tobacco, public, and school-based education, raising awareness of the impact of tobacco in, the, in those with mental illness and or substance abuse disorders, as well as advocacy around limiting exposure to secondhand smoke, smoke-free housing, 
point of sale and e-cigarettes. Pat has been a mentor to many and has been front and center at the table negotiating some of the state's toughest commercial tobacco policy fights over the last 45 years. So next I'll introduce Christina Thill. She currently is the state policy planner with the Minnesota Department of Health's Commercial Tobacco Prevention and Control Program. Christina has 28 years of experience in state and local policy initiatives and program development. She provides expertise with the development and implementation of statewide initiatives, including Tobacco 21, Smoke-Free Housing, and Behavioral Health. Christina is responsible for the oversight of the CDC grant and has expertise in developing agency policy proposals, designing new grant programs, leading the development of competitive RFPs, technical assistance and training, and grants management. She has a lot on her plate. Um, Christina's expertise in commercial tobacco policy is grounded in her experience as a local public health advocate, and I will say her astute political mind when it comes to public health advocacy makes many of us secretly wish that she would run for office. Um, sorry, uh, but I would love to see that happen. Um, and then last, I want to introduce Doug Blanke. He founded the Public Health Law Center in 2001, or 2000 rather, and has served as executive director since that time. He oversees the center's programs, including its work to reduce the harm caused by commercial tobacco use, support healthy eating, and encourage physical activity with a focus on the health of marginalized and underrepresented communities. Previously, as an assistant attorney general of the state of Minnesota, Doug oversaw the enforcement of the state's consumer protection laws and played a key role in the historic litigation against the tobacco industry in the 1990s, resulting in the seminal release of internal documents that exposed the tobacco industry's long history of deceptive marketing, advertising, and research. Doug's achievements in public health policy, legislative advocacy, and consumer protection span four decades on the local, state, national, and international stages. Doug is retiring at the end of this month, and those of us who have followed in his footsteps are forever grateful for his incredible leadership and his vision to broaden public health as a serious area of practice for other attorneys. So with that, I will turn it over to our first speaker, which is Jeannie Wycombe. Uh, a 15 minute history of the early days of tobacco control. And I'm gonna give a nod uh, for the next slide to the American Lung Association. Uh, American Lung Association was founded really to deal with lung disease, not specifically tobacco, but they are the oldest voluntary health organization in the United States. And in that position, they really have uh, shown leadership on the tobacco issue. Uh, sometimes when other organizations were very passive on the issue, the American Lung Association was out there swinging in terms of trying to get uh, change as it related uh, to tobacco. Uh, moving to the next slide, we moved to World War II. Uh, not only was tobacco a protected crop during World War II, but the workers who harvested and grew and made cigarettes were also considered protected workers. So just like those in munitions factories and like my father who worked on the railroad, uh, he was considered a protected worker because they needed to transport munitions, they needed to transport men and materials for the war. So. Uh, my father was not subjected to the draft. Uh, however, tobacco workers also weren't subjected to the draft because the, they were considered to be essential to the war effort. Uh, cigarettes were included in rations and in the long run, vastly more young men died from their free cigarettes than died from enemy bullets. Uh, a sad legacy for, for certain for that. Uh, at one point, uh, for some bizarre reason, I was researching the Minnesota poll and uh, they actually did a, a Minnesota poll 
asking if uh, people thought that the Red Cross should charge soldiers for cigarettes or should they should be made free to them. And the majority of people felt that the cigarettes ought to be free. Uh, so uh, making, making them available. And because of that, smoking rates among men uh, increased and the addiction rate increased. And then decades later, the death, deaths from that uh, skyrocketed. Uh, moving forward to the 50s and the next one, uh, it's hardly believable in today's environment that a publication in a small uh, magazine could make a difference. But in the 1950s, there weren't 200 channels. There wasn't uh, uh, the kind of media uh, that we have today. And Reader's Digest published something called Cancer by the Carton. And uh, it laid out the case that cigarettes caused cancer, believe it or not. Uh, they came out with that before the Surgeon General's report. And the tobacco industry was quite alarmed by this. And they responded in kind. They, they came up with a plan for how to deal with it. But the publication of Cancer by the Carton actually caused significant numbers of smokers to, to try to and succeed in quitting. And this was a warning, if you will, to the tobacco industry to not take any chances. Uh, and their aggressive approach towards this publication and towards future things that came out uh, shows how seriously they took the idea that informed consumers actually behaved differently. Uh, in 1954, the Marlboro Cowboy made its first ride. Marlboro cigarettes had been uh, sort of an also ran cigarette, wasn't that popular. It was mostly uh, used by women. And then they came out with the Marlboro Cowboy, which was absolutely iconic and is probably one of the most successful advertising campaigns the world has ever seen. Uh, today, even though uh, ads have not been on TV for Marlboro, I would bet most people over the age of 50 can still sing, perhaps badly, the Marlboro theme song. Um, the same year, the first smoking related lawsuit was filed and uh, nothing much happened with it. Uh, lawsuits were filed regularly from that point on and the tobacco industry took a completely scorched earth policy towards these lawsuits, basically saying we're gonna spend the other guy's money and basically drive them out of business. And that strategy worked effectively for nearly half a century. That same year, the tobacco industry issued something that called the Frank Statement. And uh, if you pull up the next slide, please. Uh, I know you can't read that, but that's an ad from uh, newspapers that was published all across the country. It was published in the St. Paul and Minneapolis papers, and I believe the New Duluth newspaper. <laughs> and the most important part of this statement is that they say, if you move to the next slide, we accept an interest in people's health as a basic responsibility, paramount to every other consideration of our business. In other words, health is more important to the tobacco industry than profits period. They said it, and they said it publicly, and they said it repeatedly. And that little statement that appeared uh, in papers across the country ended up playing in a big way in the Minnesota tobacco lawsuit. Uh, next statement. In the 1960s, the Surgeon General actually caught up with Reader's Digest with the first report that basically said smoking killed people. Uh, and in response to that, or at least in partial response to that, we got the first cigarette warning labels. Uh, cigarette smoking may be hazardous to your health. Uh, talk about a wimpy statement. But that statement, while the public health community thought it was a great victory, and that the subsequent health statements that appeared on cigarettes was a similar 
public health victory. It ended up working to the tobacco industry's benefit. And that's something that I think we need to remember every time we take a move, is that the tobacco industry has a way of turning lemons into lemonade. And this was a perfect example of it. This statement was used to protect them in lawsuits for decades by simply saying, hey, we told you it was hazardous to your health. It was right there printed on the package. How can you now sue us saying you didn't know and didn't understand? So the tobacco industry took good public health ideas and turned them on their head for their own benefit. Uh, moving on to the 70s, some interesting things begin to happen. Cigarette advertising is banned from radio and TV airways. Uh, back then, cartoon characters advertised uh, the Flintstones, advertised Winston cigarettes. Uh, Lucille Ball advertised, I can't remember what brand she was after, I think that may have been Winston also. But uh, tobacco advertising was uh, colorful, interesting, uh, it was omnipresent. But there was something called the Fairness Doctrine. And under the Fairness Doctrine, uh, television and radio stations had to play a certain number of ads from, from, that represented the other point of view. So the Heart Association, the Cancer Society, the Lung Association, all produced their own ads. And they were effective. In fact, so effective that the tobacco industry really didn't mind that much when Congress said you cannot advertise on radio and TV because then the fairness doctrine no longer existed. Organizations such as Answer got free airtime under the fairness doctrine to put our message out. And as soon as the tobacco industry no longer was doing paid commercials, that uh, the other side of the message was also off the air. How quickly the tobacco companies figured out another way to get on TV and radio, which didn't involve the fairness doctrine. And the, probably the most glaring example was Philip Morris's sponsorship of Virginia Slim's uh, tennis. Uh, they sponsored the, the tennis circuit. And if you'll go to the next slide, uh, they became almost synonymous with, with women's uh, with women's tennis. Uh, 1973, Answer was founded. Uh, I was not involved. People give me credit for being there on day, day one. I didn't get involved until 75, after the Clean Indoor Air Act was passed, Minnesota Clean Indoor Air Act was passed. Uh, next slide, please. Ah, and here we come to 73 and Philip Morris's uh, utilization of television to promote their cause. Uh, many of you will remember the name Billie Jean King. She was a fabulous female athlete. And Bobby Riggs was a, a also ran male tennis player who basically said, I can beat any woman anytime, any day. And Billie Jean said, bring it on. And she basically wiped up the floor with him. It was a really big deal. It was viewership comparable to watching the Super Bowl. Everybody wanted to see what Billie Jean King would do to Bobby Riggs because he was such a mouthy guy. Billie Jean King wore uh, the colors of Virginia Slims as she played that game. And she went on to, to serve on their board of directors. So for a fabulous athlete to sell out women in that way is highly dis disappointing. Uh, next slide. Minnesota Clean Indoor Air Act, 1975. Uh, one person gets lots and lots of credit for that, and that's uh, former state's uh, representative Phyllis Kahn. Uh, she had made an effort in the previous session to get a, something passed about that related to smoking actually on the floor of the House and Senate. And they managed to actually make the House floor smoke-free, uh, except when people were tense. It actually didn't work out very well, uh, but they managed to do something. The next year, there was uh, a committee hearing and uh, Marty Sable, who was the Speaker of the House at the time, 
was pictured blowing a plume of smoke in Phyllis Kahn's face. And the headline in the paper was, she huffs, he puffs. And his phone rang off the hook. Why are you doing, how, why are you so mean to that nice lady? And he ended up becoming a sponsor of the Minnesota Clean Indoor Air Act and actually assisted in its passage. Uh, at the time, uh, people at the Minnesota Department of Health saw it as pretty useless. Uh, one person at the Department of Health said, this isn't worth the paper it's written on, but it proved to be otherwise. They did rulemaking, they did enforcement, and it started the world along a trajectory of regulating tobacco. The Minnesota Clean Indoor Air Act was originally built on the idea of separation. If you had a four foot space between you and a smoker, you were considered to be in a smoke-free area. Um, we learned shortly that four feet of air between you and the next guy did not make for smoke-free air, but it was a start. And Minnesota was the first in the nation to have anything quite like this. Uh, the uh, Surgeon General at the time contacted every state in the nation and said, look what Minnesota did, you should do the same thing. Next slide. And Rachel, can you give me an idea on time? Yeah, you probably have five more minutes. Okay, good enough, thank you. Uh, in the 80s, uh, insurance companies did not give discounts at all for non-smokers, whether it was health uh, or uh, auto, insurance, auto insurance, none of those things. Uh, Answer actually asked for a meeting with Blue Cross because we wanted to promote the idea of discount for individual smoke, uh, individuals who bought policies. And if those individuals did not smoke, they would pay at a lower rate. And to give you a clue how our idea was viewed, we met not with uh, the actuarial people. We met with the marketing people. It was viewed as a marketing gimmick as opposed to anything that was actually reflected in the science and in the actuarial numbers. Uh, but over time, the insurance industry became among our better supporters. In 1983, Minnesota's, uh, a large Minnesota insurance company, MSI, uh, decided to make their entire workplace smoke-free. They uh, phased it in over a year's period or over a two-year period. And many people believed they would lose their entire IT department. They were absolutely convinced that computer professionals had to smoke while they were working. And since they would believe that and they would simply leave that company and go someplace else. MSI stood strong and said, if you want to leave, we'll help you with outplacement services. And nobody left. And that was the beginning of smoke-free policies. Uh, in 1984, Minnesota created the first state comprehensive tobacco control plan. And here comes one of the people upon whose shoulders we all stand. And that's Stu Hansen. Stu Hansen really was very instrumental in this effort. And it was the first plan anywhere in the world that said tobacco is a problem. Here's what we're going to do about it. And those who served on the committee were public health professionals, community advocates, and legislators. So when we completed that work, we had people who were in the legislature who had, who had been willing to sit down and look at this as a real problem and propose real solutions. Uh, next. 1980s, a really big deal. Minnesota increased the tobacco tax by a nickel and, decade, uh, and dedicated just under a penny to tobacco prevention. Again, it was the first in the world, first in the country to actually tax tobacco and spend some of the money on prevention. And Christina will be able to tell you about how some of that money was spent. 1987, Metrodome became the first professional sports facility in the country to get rid of tobacco advertising. And the fun thing about that was we met with the people from the Metropolitan Sports Facilities Commission, and they assured us that advertising on their scoreboard had to include three things, alcohol, tobacco, and cars. And if you took out any of those three things, you couldn't possibly have scoreboards. Well, they proved themselves wrong. And today there are no sports facilities in the country 
that continue to advertise tobacco. Uh, in the 1990s, move on, uh, Northwest Airlines became the first airline uh, to ban smoking on all flights in North America. Uh, there was a lot that was going on with airlines. And at the end of the day, the reason airlines went smoke free was that their employees, primarily their flight attendants, sued their socks off and said, you're responsible for our sickness. And so airlines ultimately uh, became early adopters of smoke free policies. I'm going to diverge from my slides here for a minute and recognize two cities that did something important uh, moving into the early 90s. Uh, Brooklyn Center, under the leadership of Mayor Todd Paulson, banned all point of sale tobacco advertising, period. We thought at the time, unless somebody follows Brooklyn Center, this thing's going to fall. It's going it, to, he can't stand alone. This is a small city. He can't stand alone. And of all things, the tiny village of Preston in south, so, uh, south uh, eastern Minnesota passed a similar restriction. And Brooklyn Center quietly let their ordinance go away without ever voting on a second time. It, it, it had a first vote. It, the second vote never came up. Uh, it died. But Preston moved forward and they banned point of sale advertising. Uh, the whole country of tobacco control legal advocates stepped up to try to assist Preston. But at the end of the day, we did end up with rather poor legal arguments and we lost badly in court. And that was really the end of efforts in Minnesota to regulate tobacco advertising until the most recent initiative in St. Paul, where they banned price discounting. And magically, most tobacco advertising has gone away because so much of it is related to price discounting. Uh, so what started in Brooklyn Center in 1993 finally came to fruition in St. Paul in 2021. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to Doug Blanke. Thank you, Jeannie. You know, I'm really glad to be here today because as Jeannie said, um, we all stand on the shoulders of those who've gone before us, whether we know it or not. And today I get to be here with three very broad shouldered colleagues who have been some of the driving forces behind the stories that you're hearing about today. My job, uh, my assignment is to tell you the story of the Minnesota tobacco lawsuit and to do it in 15 minutes, which is going to be a bit of a challenge for me. This lawsuit um, is what Pat McCone would call a big dang deal. And what do I mean when I say that? Well, for starters, it was the biggest lawsuit in the history of Minnesota. Eventually, every state sued the tobacco companies, but Minnesota was the second state to do so. And in filing our suit in 1994, we sued the industry for uh, various forms of fraud. And that was different than the state that had gone before us, and it became the model for all the states that followed. The, state or the case was also unusual because it was the first and only case in which a state partnered with a private organization. Minnesota joined forces with Blue Cross of Minnesota, and that partnership was crucial to our ultimate success. Um, at the end of a long trial, the case was settled and that settlement stands to this day as one of the five or six largest legal settlements in all of history. So the case is noteworthy for all of those reasons, but more than anything else, it stands as a milestone because it was the Minnesota tobacco case that opened up the millions of pages of secret documents of the tobacco industry. When you hear about things that are still coming out of those documents, know that that is because of the Minnesota tobacco case. This is the plaintiff who brought the case, my former boss, Minnesota Attorney General Hubert Skip Humphrey. I really can't overstate what a high risk decision that was. Jeannie made some reference to earlier tobacco cases. By the time the Minnesota case was filed, there had been approximately 300 cases against the tobacco industry and the tobacco industry had won every single one of those 300 cases. No one had ever collected so much as a nickel from the tobacco companies. 
Working with the private law firm of Robbins, Kaplan, Miller and Cerisi and with Blue Cross, we had been working in strict secrecy for two to three years to put together a potential lawsuit. The um, document that would initiate the lawsuit, the complaint, took 55 pages to outline our allegations. But if I had to try to boil them down to a single sentence, I would say that we alleged that all the major cigarette manufacturers had been conspiring together for 40 years to mislead the world about the hazards of smoking. And that in doing that, they had been in constant violation of Minnesota's consumer fraud laws, false advertising law, deceptive trade practices law, and more. The case, um, as we envisioned it, had three goals, truth, kids, and money. And we would recite these through the years of litigation to the point that reporters would start reciting them back to us. They had heard it so often. We wanted to get out the truth by which we meant. We wanted the tobacco industry documents to come out of those document vaults and to be shared with the world. We wanted to protect kids by doing what we could in a single lawsuit to limit the marketing practices the industry was using to target kids. And third, we wanted to recover fair compensation for the state of Minnesota, not for smokers, but for the Minnesota taxpayers, for the money that had been spent to treat sick smokers through the Minnesota Medicaid program. After three years of preparation, there came a time when we had a meeting in the Attorney General's office that I think of as the, the go, no go meeting for the Attorney General to make the decision whether we would actually file the case. There were six or seven of us in the room and we went around and shared our opinions. And when we came to the Attorney General's uh, political advisor, the advisor started warning the Attorney General about the political risk involved, that no one had won a case before, and that in fact, in political terms, 25% of all the voters were smokers and they might not take kindly to this litigation. But the Attorney General cut him off and said, I don't want to hear about politics. Let me worry about that. What I want to know is, are we right on the law and can we make a difference? And if the answer to those questions is yes, then we're going to go which is what we did. And that stands to this day as my proudest moment of 20 years in government. This is the other great unsung hero of the case, the presiding judge. Uh, the case was filed in 1994 in the Ramsey County District Court. <clears throat> the judge was the chief judge of the district court, Kenneth Fitzpatrick. There were um, at least 60 lawsuits representing the tobacco industry, all bombarding him for four years with motions and pleadings and petitions and more. And uh, Judge Fitzpatrick's only assistant was a law clerk just out of law school. The challenges of managing that case uh, affected his health. His health suffered and he started experiencing health problems that his wife feared were potentially life-threatening, but he persevered. He persevered when the industry tried to have him removed from the case um, unsuccessfully. And he persevered when they appealed his rulings literally 12 different times. And each time the appellate courts upheld Judge Fitzpatrick's rulings. What brought us to bring the case in the first place? Well, one of the driving forces was the um, proliferation in the 80s and early 90s of blatant marketing to kids by the tobacco companies. And the standout example in those days was this fellow, Joe Camel, who was introduced to the public in 1988. And after Joe Camel was introduced and marketed intensely, Camel cigarettes went from being a, a minor brand among teen smokers to the number two brand among youth smokers, second only to Marlboro's. It was also true when we filed the case that marketing to kids was so extensive that fully one out of every three teenagers in America owned at least one piece of merchandise branded with the brand of a cigarette. So it might be a, a t-shirt, a hat, a backpack, or what have you. So this was one of the big motivations for bringing the case. Another one is that in the early 90s, leading up to the filing of the case, there were several um, 
very prominent whistleblowers who really shifted the public thinking. This picture depicts Jeffrey Wigand, who was a vice president of the number three company before he went rogue. And in an extensive expose on 60 Minutes, talked about things like his company adding ammonia to alter the pH of their cigarettes in a way that would increase the uh, addictiveness of the nicotine. So as we went into 1994, the evidence continued to mount. And this was a turning point, I would have to say. This was a hearing before the Investigations Committee of the US House chaired by Henry Waxman, at which the CEOs of all the major companies, you see them here, lined up taking the um, oath, swearing to tell the truth as witnesses. And in that hearing, they proceeded under oath to go down the row and testify one by one that they did not believe that nicotine was addictive. Several of them testified as well that cancer did not or that cigarettes did not cause cancer. Uh, this group quickly got the nickname of the Seven Dwarves. So the case was filed in 1994. It didn't go to trial until January 1998. When it did go to trial, it was too big for the Ramsey County courts. The courtrooms wouldn't hold all the attorneys for the tobacco industry and all the journalists who wanted to cover the case. So Judge Fitzpatrick had to call the federal courts and ask if he could borrow the use of this larger courtroom in the federal courthouse, just three blocks down Kellogg Boulevard. At one point, Philip Morris had told him that they were spending a million dollars a week on their defense in this case. And it was um, literally four years before the, they even got to the start of trial. There were so many reporters wanting to cover it that he arranged what was quite innovative at the time. He arranged to have some wiring run in to run closed circuit television to another room on a higher floor where the media could set up their um, computers and watch the trial live on closed circuit television. The trial received extensive national media coverage, but not as much as we first expected because that media room was full when the trial began in January, but it thinned out um, quite a bit a week later as the trial got going because of another breaking news story involving President Bill Clinton and a White House intern by the name of Monica Lewinsky. I said the case was about fraud, but what kind of fraud was I talking about? We really kind of broke it down into several categories. Um, it was fraud about the health hazards of cigarettes and the diseases they cause. It was fraud about their addictiveness and the things the industry did to control the nicotine. It was about whether they uh, were marketing to kids. Um, interestingly, it was also about the fact that they had reached a secret agreement not to market their products as being safe or safer, um, which is interesting when you think about it. And um, if you think about it, you can understand why they would do that. Because if they once started to advertise a new cigarette as being safe or safer, that would really be equivalent to admitting that their old cigarettes were not safe. So they reached what they called the gentleman's agreement not to market cigarettes based on health and safety. There were also, we also had allegations that they had destroyed evidence. Now, what made the case truly stand out is that we mounted what I think of as a case within a case, a quest to get the documents. And that ran for more than three years of just grueling, grinding, scorched earth warfare. The industry refused to hand over 250,000 documents that they claimed were subject to attorney-client privilege, the largest claim of attorney-client privilege ever. Uh, eventually, we got our hands on about, I would say, maybe a third of those uh, documents, and doing that took um, almost took forever. The trial had begun and was two-thirds of the way done before the industry's appeals were exhausted, and um, Justice Clarence Thomas of the Supreme Court refused their appeal, so we did get those documents. The trial lasted four and a half months. It consisted of uh, cross-examination of, indu cross of industries, CEOs and executives, and a, a string of expert witnesses on diseases, on 
addiction on kids. We brought in a chemical engineering professor who testified that you have to think of a cigarette as a miniature chemical factory because of the 400 additives that go into cigarettes. The trial consisted also of the documents um, and of other witnesses. This was our lead witness, Dr. Richard Hurd of the Mayo Clinic, one of the world's leading experts on uh, nicotine and addiction. The jury told us after the trial that they uh, thought he reminded them of Abe Lincoln, so we knew we were off to a good start. He would later become the first chairperson of Clearway, Minnesota. The heart of the case was um, documents, the things we found in the documents. Jeannie already talked about this one, the frank statement to cigarette smokers, a full page ad that was run in um, at least three Minnesota newspapers in 1954, in which the industry promised um, to cooperate with health authorities, to put health at the top of their list of concerns, but said that they didn't believe their cigarettes were injurious to health. Um, because this statement was called a frank statement and because we kept bringing it into the courtroom and putting it in front of the jury on an easel, the jury told us after the trial that they got sick of this, uh, seeing this big blow up on the easel and started to call it Frank and would say to one another, oh my God, here comes Frank again. Um, the things in that document and the things they said to the public for 40 years were largely lies as shown by the literally hundreds and hundreds of documents that we produced. The documents were so critical that on some days the jury would just be presented with a box of documents with no, no testimony from witnesses, nothing from the lawyers, and they would be sent it back into the jury room and told, browse through these boxes of documents for the rest of the day. We call those document days. Um, do the documents included things like this one from the 70s in which an industry executive said to his boss, um, really what we're trying to do through the decades is defend ourselves in the litigation forum, uh, defend ourselves politically and in the court of public opinion. The science had become too strong for them to deny outright that their products were dangerous. So they shifted to simply creating doubt about the health charge without actually denying it. We offered abundant evidence about um, targeting of kids as well. Jeannie made reference to the Flintstones. In the 1960s, for a while, the Flintstones was a half hour television program in prime time in the evening. And um, I'm not gonna take the time to play this commercial, but to play this commercial, but in the show, the characters would actually smoke cigarettes from time to time, sing the Winston jingle, um, and talk about how great Winston's tasted. The producers of the show were asked in those days whether this wasn't <clears throat> um, something to be ashamed of, targeting kids. And their answer was, oh, the Flintstones is not aimed at kids. It's an adult cartoon show. Another thing we featured was uh, evidence of destruction of documents. This is the vice president of Philip Morris, Thomas Osdean, vice president of science. When he was examined, you see his deposition here, he was asked about things that were in the documents and more than a hundred times, he pleaded the fifth amendment and said that answering the question might tend to incriminate him. You can't blame him when you know that the documents included things like, like uh, one in particular that was found in his uh, desk files. The industry had moved its secret research laboratory out of the United States. They had bought a company in Germany and set up a bunch of uh, corporate shells to make it very hard for anyone from the US to, to find that company or to prove its connection to Philip Morris. So they moved their research there. And one of the documents in Mr. Osdean's office um, talked about avoiding direct contact with that um, laboratory. And it said in what seems to be his handwriting, if important uh, documents um, have to be sent, please send them to my home. I will act on them and destroy. So that gives you a flavor of um, some of the evidence in the four and a half month trial. At the very end of the testimony, um, the case settled, which was just a, a terrible bit of news for the jurors who had been patiently paying attention for four and a half months. But if you remember, I told you that our three goals that we had set very clearly were to get out the truth, 
to protect kids and to get compensation for the state. And when the industry came to us in the last two weeks of trial and said they wanted to talk about settlement and they were willing to talk about meeting our goals, we went into settlement talks that were held in deep secrecy for the last two weeks, um, eventually going round the clock the last couple of days. Uh, the settlement talks came down, really came down to the wire at the very end of the trial. The companies, tobacco companies had actually given their closing arguments and we were scheduled the next morning for our lead attorney seen here on the left, Mike Cerisi, to give the closing argument for the state the first thing in the morning, it was a Friday morning. Um, and we were desperately biting our nails, waiting for the last signature to come in um, by fax from one of the industry executives in New York. And uh, it got there while we were actually over at the court and the judge was threatening to make us go ahead with the case, uh, but we did get the settlement signed. What was in it? Well, in terms of truth, we got uh, public disclosure of all the documents that we had obtained in the, in the litigation and requiring them to submit any documents they were to hand over in uh, subsequent health li related litigation in the US. Those documents are now digitized and searchable on the University of California, San Francisco uh, legacy documents website. In terms of kids, we obtained a permanent injunction against any kind of marketing that could be shown to target kids. We um, brought down billboards like this one. At that time, it's hard to believe uh, if you weren't there at the time, but at that time, the majority of all the billboards in the country contained cigarette advertisements. If you put together every other billboard, the um, cigarette ads, constituted more billboards than everything else put together. We also got a complete ban on the, the swag that I talked about, the cigarette branded merchandise. What about compensation? We had proved at trial that the state had suffered what we call actual damages, actual direct payouts in the Medicaid program of about $1.7 billion. So we would have asked the jury for that and we would have asked them to give us punitive damages in addition in whatever amount they thought was fair. Uh, by settling, we got uh, an agreement that the industry would pay the state about six and a half billion dollars. That comes in in annual payments as long as the company sells cigarettes and still continues to pay the state about, uh, well, in excess of a hundred million dollars every year. Blue Cross is our co-plaintiff um, got a smaller recovery and had to pay taxes on it, but that still left them with more than $200 million, which they used to create the Center for Prevention at Blue Cross, which has funded activities that many of you know about, uh, things like the, the Nice Ride Bicycle Share Program uh, is one of the smaller examples. And now they tend to focus a lot of their energy on issues of racism as a public health crisis. The settlement also committed $200 million to create what became Clearway, Minnesota. Um, and it included a payment of uh, about $400 million to the attorneys who had taken the risk and brought the case. And then um, others of us uh, did get a, a very nice, very nice t-shirt. Um, it's very high quality, very proud to have that t-shirt. Uh, I don't have time to play the um, Clearway ad, but I hope you're familiar with it. Um, and, and certainly with Clearway's advocacy over the years with the quit line and with um, the research and advocacy that Clearway supported. So when you put all of those things together, the legacy of the lawsuit, in my opinion, has been a change in the narrative that we shifted from seeing cigarettes as a dangerous product to also seeing um, the tobacco epidemic as something caused by the executives of the tobacco companies. And I think that trans transformation has really um, made it possible for us to achieve the policy gains of the last 20 years and that it reverberates to this day. Now I have an additional slide here about some of the other heroes on whose shoulders we stand. I don't think I have time to talk about them, but I really do want to 
um, name them and call them out. So I'm hoping that when we're done here today, when we get to the Q&A section, I hope somebody in the audience will ask me who were these unsung heroes that you see briefly on this screen. You know what, Doug? I think it is important to recognize these folks. So why don't you go ahead and just call out each of thank, them? Thank you, Rachel. Um, I really appreciate that. I mentioned uh, Judge Kenneth Fitzpatrick, um, who was the hero of the lawsuit, who stood strong through all of those years and um, made it into retirement, a, a long, um, rich retirement, but who has now passed away. There are, there are many heroes, but uh, so I don't mean to leave people out by including the ones I have here, but uh, these are people that, that I have known and cared about. Um, Lieutenant Philip Bartuschek from the Albert Lee Police Department. I can't remember how he became involved in the first instance, but but through the work on tobacco retailing and youth access and compliance checks, Phil um, became aware of and then deeply engaged on the issues of tobacco control and youth, not just in Albert Lee, where he was a leader, but he actually would go to other communities as they were considering ordinance changes and would testify in behalf of those. Um, and we lost Phil to cancer as well about, um, about 10 years ago. On the right-hand side, you, you see Kathy Hardy. Christina will be talking about the pioneering work that Minnesota did when it was literally the first state in the country to have a comprehensive tobacco control plan, to have a government-funded media campaign, uh, to think about how we denormalize smoking. Kathy Hardy was at the Department of Health, one of the two people in the, the nation's first um, office of, I, I, I've forgotten the title, but I think it was Smoking and Health. Uh, Kathy went on to be the deputy director of the Smokeless States Project, funding uh, smoke-free coalitions in every state, and then became the first executive director of Clearway. And she passed away uh, during the COVID epidemic just this year. Um, down at the bottom, you see um, Pat McCone's um, colleague and partner in crime in taking Duluth smoke free through many twists and turns, Steve O'Neill, just a wonderful human being, one of those people who, um, after he's gone, you, you realize um, just what a great person he was and wish you had spent the time to become closer to him. Um, Steve was kind of a, I think of him now as kind of a saintly person who who devoted, uh, left his previous work and devoted himself to becoming an advocate for the homeless and affordable housing in Duluth, um, and who also served as a St. Louis County Commissioner. Up on the top, you see uh, Jean Harris. Jean Harris was one of the first uh, members of the Clearway Board, but she was also the mayor of Eden Prairie. She had been the first African-American graduate of the University of Virginia Medical School. And, uh, went on to become the Secretary of Health and Human Services in the state of Virginia, which was the home to Philip Morris, of course. And because she was outspoken about smoking, she was she reported that she was always seated in the middle of a group of smokers who would blow smoke in her face. And, and um, in time, after advocating for smoke-free policies in Eden Prairie, Jean Harris uh, was diagnosed with lung cancer, even though she had never smoked a day in her life but all that exposure to secondhand smoke ended up taking her life. Finally, um, down in the lower right-hand corner, um, this, is, this is a stand-in photograph, but um, I, I just want to tell folks that the night before one of the Duluth ballot um, votes, and Duluth went to the ballot multiple times, uh, Pat McCone being the... Um, the voice and face of that campaign found that her beagle, Scooby, had been poisoned. Um, so I, I'm giving Scooby an honorary place in the tobacco, Minnesota Tobacco Control Hall of Fame. So um, these are, are six of the giants on whose shoulders we stand. Um, and it's important to know about them because the time will come for all of you who are in the audience today when people are looking back at the things that you have achieved um, that make it possible for them to continue the relay race. 
So with that, I'll hand it back to you, Rachel. Great, thank you, Doug. And now we're gonna hear from Pat McCone to talk about some of the policy developments that happened after the tobacco settlement. Uh, I just wanna be sure you can see my slides, yes? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, well, thank you and thank you, Doug. And thanks for those uh, great memories uh, um, and recognizing Scooby. We don't know for sure who, what, or why, but we know when it happened. Um, yeah, and, and Jeannie, I, <laughs> thank you for the accolades to the American Lung Association. But you, I often tell people I don't remember dates or years unless I've given birth to something. And in 1976, I gave birth to a wonderful young man. <laughs> it was a baby at the time, but uh, I had to choose a smoking or non-smoking room when I was admitted to the hospital for that birth. And uh, that was an uh, interesting choice to make in those days. You think it was not happening. So let's go Y2K and beyond. And this is one of those sung heroes, uh, Ramel Jones, that in 2000, Moose Lake became the first city to adopt a clean indoor air ordinance. This is a very small town on your way north. And I remember uh, Steve O'Neill and myself and one of our uh, advocate, one of our other staff, and she was literally crying, <laughs> saying, I don't want to call this person because Ramel owned one of the cafes, one of the smokiest cafes in town. And it turns out that she lost both her parents uh, to a form, uh, one to lung cancer that had never been smokers. And she was very much an, an advocate, a humble, quiet, strong voice uh, that came. I'd pick her up uh, in Moose Lake. We'd head down to the Capitol and she is really, a, 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 a really one of those uh, leaders. And Little Moose Lake was the first town uh, the first, uh, the first county in Minnesota was Olmsted County, and a lot of that work uh, was done by uh, Zumbro Valley Medical Center and uh, Dr. Nabrga. He he came to a public hearing up in Cloquet, and the opposition was totally inebriated, <laughs> and it was a feisty de debate. And he took a lot of lessons back, but anyways, helped a lot with uh, passing the, the first county policy in uh, 2001. And then uh, we talk about uh, the endowment, uh, that one-time big chunk of money, the money that Minnesota got is a little bit complicated. I always tell the story that it's like publisher's clearinghouse. You get a big chunk now, and then every year to perpetuity, you get paid uh, millions of dollars. And that's not tobacco tax, that's the payment from the settlement. And this funded uh, Minnesota's youth prevention program called Target Market. And here we have in 2007, you will see this is our, our Freedom to Breathe, our Clean Indoor Air Act. And there's Ramel Jones, uh, Arts Cafe, right behind Governor Palenti outside uh, signing the, the law into the legislation into law. And that was kind of a, a <laughs> if you ever go to one of these ceremonies, get close to the person handing out pens. Because Ramel, you see all those pens on the table, she never got one of those pens. I got one of the pens, she didn't. And I think it was uh, at the 10 year anniversary in 2017, we had a little reunion of folks that had worked on it. I had that pen and I uh, presented it to Ramel because she rightfully needed to have one of those pens in her history, her family history. In 2013, we raised taxes $1.60 a pack. That was a very huge, a huge, I'm gonna call it cessation program because it was. Many people that smoke tell you they know the year they change, they quit because a price drove it. When it went to a dollar a pack, when it went to a quarter a pack, but when the tax got raised by $1.60, this was a huge implication on the number of people that decided this is, this is it, I am going to uh, stop using these products. And lots of this work, I have to give credit also, I don't have a, a lot to say, uh, a lot of slides that represent this, but as Doug has said, as Jeannie has said, that this work is on the shoulders of a lot of people, but it is also the work of many people coming together in coalition and for the Minnesota now called the Smoke Free Generation Coalition. But there has been a, fairly strong Minnesota coalition uh, 
working together for de literally decades to get behind some of these changes and have made very powerful strides uh, in reducing the harm from tobacco. In 2014, uh, we addressed e-cigarettes in our Clean Indoor Air Act and, and we're one of the first states to do that, uh, uh, including that child resistant packaging. It seems like decades ago because I think the pandemic screwed up all of our uh, references to time. It's like pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, how long, whatever. I, I don't know about you, but that's kind of happened to me. In 2014, Minneapolis was the first city to restrict, restrict the sale of flavored tobacco products and restricted them to adult only stores. I mean, 2014, it seems like just yesterday this happened, but now we're looking at, I don't know, uh, you know, eight years <clears throat> and uh, has strengthened it since that time. In 2016, the copay for counseling and medications to quit smoking are dropped from medical assistance and MinCare because we know through all of the, well, through most of these decades, I can't say all because in the 50s, uh, when some, when the male population in our country smoked at a rate of almost 50%, it, it went across all economic uh, ladders within our state, in, within our country. But now if you think about the, number one kind of predictor if somebody is a person that smokes or are going to smoke, it's poverty. Poverty is a huge uh, underlying uh, demographic that, that, uh, that is still struggling with this addiction. In 2017, Edina was the first city to raise the age to purchase tobacco products to 21. And that grew, that grew quickly. And who would know that it would pass at a federal level uh, as fast as it did? And I'm gonna say something about that in my last slide. It'll, it'll relate to that. Uh, in 2019, uh, due to the work of Clearway Minnesota, knowing that they were a life limited organization, that those dollars that came from the settlement monies that Doug talked about, uh, Formed, formed what was then called Minnesota Partnership for Action Against Tobacco and then became Clearway. Uh, they knew that they were no longer going to be in business and we still wanted to have uh, resources for treating nicotine addiction and provide a variety of cessation programs. And that transition happened it, during the 2019 legislative session and went to the Minnesota Department of Health and programs began in 2020. And then came 2020 and the COVID pandemic joined the world cigarette pandemic. I almost feel like we've made more headway on the COVID pandemic than we have on the world cigar cigarette pandemic. But uh, during the COVID pandemic, I actually did some <laughs> cleaning out of an office that our organization closed. And I found this journal of medicine. It's the first time I had seen pandemic used in a headline on a magazine and it was about cigarette smoking, the use of tobacco products. And there's Camel. I have to say about Camel Joe too. Doug, uh, you know, Camel Joe was so vivid in kids' minds. When I would go to classrooms and speak to kids, they would actually tell me that Camel Joe was an animated character and spoke. And that those uh, billboards and, and pool that he was shooting, that there was also music involved. And he never spoke was animated like the Flintstones, never ever. But it was such powerful imagery and everywhere that um, it became ingrained in, in their minds. So that, that uh, just had to add that anecdote in when you were showing Joe, I thought, yeah, kids thought Joe talked and he was super cool. And then in 2021, uh, Clearway, the life limited organization that was founded from settlement dollars uh, ended. And, and we're still, I think, recovering from that. Uh, many of us say uh, we're funded to continue to do our tobacco control work under Clearway dollars and had the opportunity to do direct lobbying with those dollars. And I think we're still gonna be working hard to figure out how we move forward without that level of funding available in our state. And then during 2021, again, part of the work of the coalition that wanted to get more money, including leadership of Clearway, more money to the Department of Health, to the tobacco control budget, and $4 million annually got added to MDH's budget 
to address tobacco and vaping and youth prevention because we know as Jeannie said you know the industry is always one step ahead of us and good at using our work to morph it into other products and things that they can continue to deliver nicotine um, to sell it's all about money and then in 2021 and and uh, under the leadership of ANSWER, the city of St. Paul passed one of the, mo the most comprehensive commercial tobacco ordinance in the, in the United States. And uh, hopefully we'll continue that progress in other communities across the state. I think staff that have worked with me know that usually during the year I have a motto and I'll repeat it many times. I, sometimes, I have lifetime mottos too. When we have success or when we don't, it's cupcake time. But oftentimes when we're working on policy work, and, and staff or, or colleagues are saying how discouraging it or, or how hard it is and how, how much people push back and name call, et cetera. I'll say, well, then we're doing good work because change is upsetting. Good change upsets people and bad change upsets people. And if we're not getting pushback on our work, on our efforts, then I have to think maybe it's not real change because the definition, one of the definitions of change and why people resist is because they believe they will lose something of value. And for the tobacco industry, it's money and customers and customers are money or the fear that they'll not be able to adapt in ways. And I think sometimes our business owners, that's what drives their fear of the change. They're not sure they're going to be able to adapt. So as we look to the future, I hope we always can use a barometer that says, is there a level of uneasiness or upset, especially with the tobacco industry about the work we're doing? And if there's not, if they sat side beside us, because I was there when Richard Hertz, Dr. Hertz sat and testified and Aldria was on the other side testifying for Tobacco 21. And I have to wonder, hmm, I just have to wonder. So uh, with that, I am going to stop sharing and pass this on to who I call the MDH tobacco control historian, my friend and colleague, Christina Thill. Well, thank you, Pat. And I am gonna start sharing my screen. Give me a minute. Okay, thank you so much to Jeannie, Pat and Doug. I could listen to the three of you talk about Minnesota's history and all of the stories for ours. Um, I really appreciate your leadership in this movement. I was asked to provide a historical snapshot of our programs, our funding, and our grants. And I would like to let everyone know that information that is contained in this presentation is adapted from a 2007 National Conference on Tobacco or Health presentation, and also from our many reports to the legislature on our funding. As Jeannie had mentioned earlier, in 1975, Minnesota Clean, uh, Minnesota Clean Indoor Air Act was passed, and it wasn't until 1985 where funding was available to the department uh, for someone to begin uh, enforcement of the Clean Indoor Air Act. In 1982, and yes, uh, 40 years ago, then Commissioner uh, Mary Madonna Ashton convened two committees to recommend strategies to promote non-smoking. And it was through her vision that uh, MDH created the Center for Non-Smoking and Health to plan a statewide uh, non-smoking uh, initiative. And this had uh, marked the first time that the tobacco prevention work had been done at the health department. Prior to that, uh, the tobacco related work was done by our colleagues in the chronic disease and environmental uh, epidemiology section. So the Commissioner of Health had appointed uh, members to this Minnesota Technical Advisory Committee, and uh, they were to develop a statewide plan for the initiative. Uh, the committee uh, was responsible for uh, developing strategies to accomplish three goals. Uh, the goals included preventing young people from starting to smoke, encourage and assist smokers to quit, and promote clean indoor air. Uh, the committee was asked to accomplish these goals through five areas, and those areas included public communication education, schooling, youth education, public and private regulatory measures, 
economic incentives and disincentives, and also information needs. So the subcommittee um, met uh, in these five areas, and they put forward 39 recommendations that were combined with uh, background research to develop uh, the Minnesota plan for non-smoking and health. And here is a photo of the summary of the Minnesota plan for non-smoking and health. In 1984, the plan was released and it was uh, the first state plan in the nation uh, that was developed to uh, develop a comprehensive statewide tobacco prevention initiative. They had a 20 member advisory committee. And as I mentioned earlier, the 39 recommendations were included. There were over 2,000 copies that were published and distributed within eight months. And at that time, Surgeon General Sierra Coop uh, visited Minnesota to support the plan uh, for non-smoking and health. From 1985 to 1986, uh, the plan led to legislation that was introduced with the support of the governor for the omnibus non-smoking Disease Prevention Act, and Minnesota enacted this first le state legislation to earmark a portion of the cigarette excise tax to support smoking prevention programs. The initiative was funded by a fraction of one cent cigarette tax, and the two-year appropriation for this initiative was $2.7 million dollars and uh, that went to MDH and then 1.3 million to the Minnesota Department of Education to implement non-smoking programs. The initiative between the Department of Health and the Department of Education was the first focus of national attention and it was characterized as the first comprehensive legislatively funded initiative to curb tobacco use. The mission of the initiative was to market a tobacco-free lifestyle to Minnesotans. Uh, during the same time, uh, MDH developed the Smoking Attributable Mortality, Morbidity, and Economic Costs, which we call SAMIC, and it was used to calculate smoking-related costs. This was important because it provided us with a tool to calculate um, these smoking related costs, uh, SAMIC was then used by other states and then by CDC. Uh, there was an agreement between the Department of Health and CDC for the use of it, and I believe it's still used today. Uh, during this time, MDH uh, awarded local grants to address the goals and the plan and implement strategies in the community, schools, and healthcare settings. And the Department of Education at that time partnered with the American Lung Association to develop tools for schools to implement non-smoking policies. Also, uh, this was the first time that students um, in public schools were surveyed. The Minnesota Plan for Non-Smoking and Health also included the first state-funded anti-smoking media campaign in the United States. Uh, the agency had awarded a $2 million contract, and with the first phase of the campaign, it included an extensive six-week campaign, which utilized existing ads, or excuse me, existing PSAs, um, and then uh, the ad agency went on to develop uh, new ads. What's important about this, oops, important about this time period was uh, Minnesota launched the Smoke-Free Generation PSAs, and uh, at that time, uh, Jesse, the body Ventura, was one of the uh, individuals who appeared in one of those PSAs, along with the Cosby kids. And uh, those ads aired uh, during, excuse me, during the Minnesota State High School Tournament. Uh, Minnesota Department of Health received over uh, 660,000 calls for a smoke-free generation t-shirt, and uh, those t-shirts were distributed to youth across Minnesota. Uh, then first media campaign uh, was targeted um, to youth and uh, also to women. And uh, we also evaluated the media campaign for youth awareness of the ads and also if smoking rates um, were decreasing among women. And at that time, the, that evaluation, it showed that smoking rates did not decrease. 
um, for women. Uh, you see here an image of the smoking animals. Uh, there's also the butts are gross. This um, was part of the first media campaign that had been launched uh, to reach youth. Uh, in a news release, uh, Commissioner Ashton stated that she believed the new ads will make an important contribution to public health in Minnesota. And in 1989, uh, the Minnesota Department of Health unveiled its new ads um, that were dis designed to discourage smoking. And uh, these ads appeared uh, on television, on uh, transit stops, and also on radio. And these ads included the campaign, why don't they just call them what they are? And as you can see here on the bus sides, it has a pack of cigarettes that says malignant and on um, the other image, it says money suckers. The Department of Health also in partnership with Minnesota Twins developed a poster with Kirby Puckett. And this is uh, around the same time that the Metrodome was uh, going smoke free. And uh, Kirby Puckett um, is, is, states here, I can handle smoking fastballs, it's smoking cigarettes, I've got a problem with. In later years, the Department of Health also uh, teamed up with professional sports teams to develop uh, additional posters. So in 1991 um, to 1999, uh, Minnesota Department of Health, along with American Cancer Society, submitted a joint proposal to the National Cancer on um, in National Cancer Institute, and it was for the American Stop Smoking Intervention Study, or what we call ASSIST. And uh, Minnesota was one of 17 states that was funded under uh, the National ASSIST program. And uh, this is really an important um, time period for Minnesota. Um, Minnesota ASSIST funded many local coalitions across the state. Uh, including uh, nonprofit organizations, uh, community health boards, tribal nations. It was during this time that I began working in Chisago County for a Minnesota CIS coalition. And we, um, along with other CIS coalitions in the state, worked on strategies to reduce youth tobacco use and access to tobacco products, eliminate exposure to secondhand smoke, increase awareness through media advocacy and engage youth in local advocacy efforts. ASSIST was funded um, from 1991 to 1999. And uh, during the final years of the ASSIST program, that's when the Department of Health also launched the Minnesota Tobacco-Free Communities for Children program. And that was with the state funds that were previously awarded um, to the state. Uh, what happened during that time is the media campaign sunsetted and uh, funds had been reduced through various budget cuts and uh, what remained was uh, some funds for this uh, program that was distributed to uh, community health agencies across the state. Uh, at this time, MBH also housed the FDA and SINAR programs, which uh, eventually made their way over to the Department of Human Services. Uh, in 1999, uh, CDC had funded all states and territories through the National State-Based Tobacco Control Program. And this was the first time that we received ongoing funding from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to focus on uh, our tobacco control goals. And the goals laid out by CDC at this time are shown there, prevent initiation of tobacco use among youth and adults, uh, eliminate exposure to secondhand smoke, pr promote quitting among adults and youth, and identify and eliminate tobacco-related disparities. Uh, the support that we received from CDC helped maintain our infrastructure and capacity to implement a comprehensive tobacco control program at the state. As Doug had mentioned earlier, uh, Minnesota Department of Health did receive funds through the tobacco settlement. I know this image is a little difficult to read. It is included in one of our legislative reports. It shows here the tobacco settlements and the funds from the tobacco settlements were then um, 
uh, put into endowments. You see two endowments here. One is the Medical Education and Research Endowment. And then the endowment on the right is the Tobacco Use Prevention and Local Public Health Endowment. And uh, the Department of Health received the the interest off those endowments. And so uh, one is for statewide tobacco prevention, the other is local tobacco prevention. And then the third bucket there is the local uh, public health endowment. And we had called our the program or the initiative at that time, the Minnesota Youth Tobacco Prevention Initiative. Um, it evolved out of past state efforts for tobacco prevention and control, including previous initiatives uh, like Minnesota Assist and the Tobacco Free Communities for Children program. Uh, these previous programs laid a solid foundation for our work. The Minnesota legislature uh, des designated that local public health portion of the endowment on the far right um, be distributed in a formula to community health service agencies to reduce risk behaviors other than tobacco. And uh, that was the first time that funding had been dedicated solely for addressing um, youth risk behaviors. So the Minnesota Youth Tobacco Prevention Initiative, we had a number of intervention areas that focused on community policy, school action, and all those intervention areas uh, really focused on some of our overarching goals uh, that were also funded through CDC. Uh, and it also uh, focused on implementing comprehensive school-based tobacco prevention programs and youth anti-tobacco advocacy. Uh, during that time period, uh, Funds were also uh, awarded uh, through some of our grants to support uh, the new state law to reduce youth access to commercial tobacco products. In uh, 1999 to 2003, the Minnesota Youth Tobacco Initiative funded 27 local public health grants, uh, 23 population at risk grants, 31 youth access enforcement grants and six statewide TA and training grants. Uh, the Public Health Law Center uh, was one of those uh, statewide TA grants that received funding from us as well um, as the Association for Non-Smokers Minnesota. And uh, we're very thankful for uh, their, their applying for these uh, funds to help uh, support all of our grantees during that time period. Target Market, the youth-led movement, American Lung Association was awarded that contract. So we had Target Market, the org is what we called it, and then also the public information campaign uh, that um, educated youth on the tobacco industry's marketing efforts. We also were able to fund the Minnesota Youth Tobacco Survey, and also, as I mentioned earlier, the Youth Risk Behavior Endowment funded 50 uh, community health service agencies. So the Target Market Youth Org, uh, that was a statewide youth movement. There was a statewide youth advisory board. It was youth led and adult guided. Each county had a Target Market uh, group that uh, met and out of Target Market was a training that uh, was described as Manipulation 101. Target Market Media uh, Campaign, it was uh, a broad statewide campaign. Uh, it was evaluated and shown to be effective. Uh, target market appeared at youth events, whether it was in skate parks or a, a basketball tournament, target market was there. Uh, they had a document truck that uh, made trips all across the state to educate teens on how tobacco manufacturers um, aim their advertising at youth. And as Doug had described earlier about the documents, here is one target market billboard that appeared in 2000, uh, referencing one of those target market, or one of those documents. Um, and it says Cherry Skull is for somebody who likes the taste of candy, if you know what I'm saying. And it uh, was a quote from a former US tobacco sales rep in 1994. In 2003, uh, Minnesota Youth Tobacco Prevention Initiative ended when the Tobacco Use Prevention and Local Public Health Endowment Fund was eliminated. Uh, the Minnesota legislature um, 
at that time had appropriated $3.7 million for uh, youth tobacco prevention, and that became the Tobacco Free Communities in Minnesota program. Uh, at the time, we were closing out all of the grants. Um, we were also awarding new grants through an RFP, uh, a competitive RFP, and the focus was on uh, creating tobacco free environments uh, in Minnesota. And we had funded uh, a number of local grants and population at risk grants. Um, and these grantees uh, worked on various strategies uh, that uh, focused on implementing policies or involving youth in leadership roles and planning and implementing advocacy efforts. I've listed both the uh, legislative reports there if you'd like to learn more. Another um, important um, uh, notation that I like to make during this time is, you know, the work that our tobacco free communities grants were doing at this time was uh, was groundbreaking. I mean, we had grantees that were working on tobacco free park policies. Uh, we also had grantees that focused on uh, tobacco free foster care, tobacco free post secondary campuses. So there were a number of firsts that were happening with a number of our grantees at this time. Uh, we continue to fund the tobacco free communities uh, grants through our RFP process. Uh, in 2008, we had a million dollars from that 3.221. Uh, the funds had been reduced over the years uh, due to some budget cuts. Uh, however, uh, in 2008, uh, we had a million dollars uh, dedicated to our tribal tobacco grant program. Also important note during this time, Clary, Minnesota and also Blue Cross Blue Shield Center for Prevention awarded grants. Uh, Clary had policy grants and Blue Cross had uh, grants that were really focused on uh, clean indoor air. And at that time, MDH also had funds uh, that were supporting uh, that effort as well. And uh, you know, it was the work of many of these local grantees that led to these um, ordinances that were uh, implemented for smoke-free bars and restaurants. I also just wanted to note that Clary Minnesota's LAMP program, we supported that. Um, it, it's a valuable program. Uh, the LAMP um, alumni um, who had been participants of that program and uh, I believe it was 2013, sent a letter to uh, Governor Dayton uh, indicating support for a cigarette tax increase. And uh, that was a really important um, letter that influenced the governor. And he was quoted in the paper as, as indicating that. Uh, the SHIP funding was awarded back in 2009. And then also on uh, the slide here is the important work that uh, was done through our community voices. Uh, project. I know you can't see the slide very well, but it's our current uh, funding and grant programs. And we have our youth e-cig prevention cessation initiative, as Pat mentioned, $4 million new funds uh, for our commercial tobacco free communities grants. We've awarded 2.1 a million or 2.21 million, excuse me, in our tribal tobacco grant program. Uh, has a million dollars in grant awards, and then our statewide cessation services uh, is funded at 2.58 million. So finally, I would just like to thank um, all of the partners who were engaged in our efforts over the years to reduce commercial tobacco use in Minnesota, including Jean, Doug, and Pat, and all of their contributions that they have made. Um, to our state. And uh, like Doug, um, I was asked to um, just touch on a, a few colleagues who have uh, been leaders in this work um, and who are no longer with us. Doug had mentioned Kathy Hardy. She was uh, the program manager at the time that helped launch that first state plan in Minnesota. And uh, you know, we continue to do strategic planning to this day. And I always think of Kathy when we start our strategic plan efforts and the groundwork that she laid. I'd also like to take a minute and um, remember Dennis Presley, who was a grants manager uh, for the Populations at Risk Grants. Dennis worked closely with Barry Denier, and I um, 
Uh, always remember Dennis and Barry when we talk about our populations at risk grants and all of the wonderful work that those nonprofit organizations did with our uh, tobacco endowment funds. And then finally, Donna Isham, she was the grants manager for our American Indian and Tribal Grants Program. And Donna really uh, stepped into that role and uh, led so much of that work with our tribal grants. And finally, just want to again say thanks to all of our partners who contributed to our success of these programs over many decades. And I will turn it back to you, Rachel. Great. Thank you, Christina um, and Pat and Doug and Jeannie. And I'm going to ask um, all of you to turn on your video. Um, we are just a couple minutes over time, but I did want to just have uh, the opportunity for you to give some closing comments. Um, and so I have a quick question for you. Looking to the future, what do you see as critical commercial tobacco fights ahead? And do you have any advice for all of the attendees today who are um, listening to these amazing stories and layers upon layers of work that have happened over the decades. Who wants to start? Go for it, Doug. Um, in terms of looking ahead, I guess um, one thing I would say is, I think it's time for us to really reframe what we do and stop talking about tobacco control and start talking instead about how we're phasing out tobacco. I think that's overdue. Um, and what does that mean? It means different things to different people, but, but first it's the mindset that this does not continue indefinitely, that we are setting a limit and we're gonna get rid of it. Um, for me, what, that, uh, what comes first to mind is, um, as I always say, whoever controls the nicotine wins. So for me, it's looking at this question of, mandating um, reductions in nicotine level. Um, in terms of advice, I, I don't know if I have advice, but all the stories we heard today going back so many years, one thing after another and how resilient the tobacco industry is, helps you understand why people will often say that this is not a sprint, it's a marathon. But um, I would say, no, it's not a marathon, it's a relay. and um, those of you who are attending this webinar today, you've got the baton now. And those of us who are the, the old timers, we're looking to you for where you go with it. And we know you're going to make us proud. Thanks, Doug. Who's up next? Jeannie? I'd like to say, I think one of the biggest risks is that as we are less and less exposed to smoke, uh, people see it as less and less of a problem and are going to find it difficult to see any need to, refund, to fund these programs. Uh, for people who never encounter tobacco smoke, uh, they may think the problem is solved, but it's not. It's, I mean, it's, it's whack-a-mole. You push it down here and it pops up there. The tobacco industry is ever so innovative. Uh, my advice is follow the science. Uh, because it is ever so easy to reduce ourselves to coloring contests and things that really don't make much difference. And if you say we're going to follow the science wherever it goes, you're going to be okay. And sometimes that may mean you're standing kind of alone out there. And that's okay. As Pat said, if nobody's objecting, you probably aren't doing anything very important. So follow the science and don't be afraid. Yeah, I, I, I'll go next. Yeah, I, I think uh, I completely agree with Doug. What's tobacco prevention and control? That's so like, well, we want this stuff gone. And I, I'm seeing more and more nicotine because it's produced, you know, synthetic nicotine. But I, I think harm reduction is one of our biggest challenges in the future. I, I, I really do. I think it's going to be a uh, it's a tough issue. And I agree with Jeannie, if you haven't been around smoke, people ask me when the clean, when freedom to breathe passed, if I was out of a job. I mean, if you haven't been around it, you just don't. And, you know, so I, I think those things, I think funding has always been our challenge when you have to hire staff and they go through what they go through in these campaigns and worry if they're going to get funded again in a year or two years or three. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's hard. And I think funding is always, uh, 
unfortunately going to be a challenge for us. And so I, I think it's, a, I loved it, Doug, when you said it's a, a relay and it's lifetimes, it's many lifetimes. Cause I, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's lifetimes. So be strong, uh, follow the, follow the science and then watch where the money goes. And so, yeah, be brave, be bold. Thanks, Pat. Christina, you get the last word. Oh, I don't want the last word, uh, but I will um, share. I'm sure, I don't know if people can see these. So these are two cigarette packs, um, the camel packs that Doug had mentioned. And, you know, this was targeted to my generation and at that time. And I think we need to continually um, watch as to how the industry is marketing these products to young people. And, you know, I've saved these packs over the years, just as a reminder as to how the industry changes and they morph and how they'll continue um, to uh, attract young people to their product. Uh, you know, I think about funding. Our funding has fluctuated over the decades. Our grant programs have changed in terms of their focus. But my advice is always celebrate the small wins because one day you're going to look back on that and that's going to be the history that you're proud of, you know, to talk about. Great. Thank you once again to all of you for uh, sharing your wisdom and thoughts from um, your experience. And hopefully those who attended or took away some good information, some key takeaways for how to move their work forward too. And certainly everyone should uh, feel free to reach out to any of these panelists if you want to learn more about any of the you know, instrumental work that they've done over the years. So thanks everyone for joining us today.